typically when talking about headhunters. The mind would tend to cast up images of far-off lands like those of darkest Africa, the Amazon Basin, or the jungles of Papua New Guinea. But one should be warned that the Celts too did have a little fencing for a head or two to decorate their own little dwellings. To the Iron Age Celtic people, the head was believed to be the vessel of the soul. And in the eyes of the Celts, although the body had stopped functioning, the individual spirit was still within, and therefore good old Aunt Mabel could still be around to smile upon all her kin. As for one's enemies, however, the taking of their heads was much desired. And just as with old Aunt Mabel, the soul was within, and the persecution of one's enemies need not stop on the battlefield. <coughs> to the Celts, honour was to be found in the collecting of the enemy's heads, and they kept them as trophies and to do with them as they pleased. This, of course, also sent a message to any clear-minded nimble four that it would seem very unwise to go getting yourself into, well, a bit of a scrap with those tribes that may just want to take your severed head and inflict upon it much humiliation and indignity for eternity. So, as can be sure, nobody wants to end up with their head stuck up on a spike in order to decorate the abode and battlements of their enemy, with their final mission being that, for all eternity, or at least until your head rots and falls to the ground, that they should send a message to other tribes that this will be your future if you get on the wrong side of these guys. I'm sure that is something that most would want to avoid at all costs. So now, let's take a look at the evidence available to us that supports that the taking and veneration of human heads was practiced amongst the ancient Celts. Evidence exists through the writings of the classical writers of the time. Posidonius, Diodorus, Siclus, and Strabo. Also through Celtic mythology, such as the story of Bran the Blessed, whose head was taken to London to protect Britain from invasion. And this, then, is all backed up by a number of archaeological excavations, many of which have found that heads were often displayed upon the entrance gates of hill forts and sanctuaries. As a clear example of this, there is the shrine in France called the Rogapitou Shrine, and it had a very brightly painted stone archway for an entrance, and within the upright pillars of the archway, there were crevices in which human skulls were placed. Again, at the sanctuary of Entremont, 15 male skulls were uncovered, with a number of them 
still bearing the marks of the spikes to which they had been fixed for display. At Braydon Hill in Gloucestershire, there was a complete row of skulls uncovered near the entrance of the fort. It is believed that they had fallen from a position above the gate that led into the fort. Now, let's look at what some of the classical writers at the time had to say. According to Diodorus Siculus, the Gauls cut off the heads of the enemies slain in battle and attached them to the necks of their horses. The blood-stained spoils they handed over to their attendants and carried off as booty while striking up a pian and singing a song of victory. And they nail up these first fruits upon their houses just as those who lay low wild animals and certain kinds of hunting. They embalm in cedar oil the heads of the most distinguished enemies and preserve them carefully in a chest and they display them with pride to strangers saying that for this head one of their ancestors or his father or the man himself refused a large sum of money they say that some of them boast that they refused the weight of the head in gold. And then Strabo tells us, There is also that custom, barbarous and exotic, which attends most of the northern tribes. When they depart from the battle, they hang the heads of their enemies from the necks of their horses. And when they have brought them home, nail the spectacle to the entrance of their houses. At any rate, Posidonius says that he himself saw the spectacle in many places, and that although he first loathed it, afterwards, through his familiarity with it, he could bear it calmly. So it seems clear that the Celts did indeed collect the heads of their enemies and some were held in veneration along maybe with those of their ancestors or maybe perhaps they were just kept in a different box. Some of these heads were clearly more prized than others and the head of a well-known or famous chieftain was a favourite prize in one's collection. One to be proud of and shown off to impress friends, family and rivals. Well, you can just imagine a dinner party at the tribal leader's place must have been a very interesting event that is if it just wasn't for the fact that you too could end up pride of place in this very impressive collection if you enjoyed this and would like to hear more then please remember to like and subscribe and click the notification bell icon to be notified when a new video is released.